Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum's webinar and podcast series, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mr. Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forum's Israel office, join us here each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to update us on all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 15 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And now with no further ado, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and good evening from Israel. Um, well, this is possibly, probably uh, the last uh, Israel Insider webinar before we have a potentially fully functioning government for the first time in uh, two years plus. Uh, at four o'clock on Sunday, if there are no last minute surprises, there will be a new government sworn in. Um, there's still a little bit to go and the pressure's still on. Uh, the, the sort of calendar uh, of events, let's say, uh, that's supposed to take place over the next few days is as follows. By Friday, um, all of the coalition agreements with the various parties have to be handed into the Knesset Speaker's Office. That means um, the, the, the agreements that Yesha did as the ruling party or the largest party, the party which uh, currently has the mandate from the president to form a government, uh, has been signing agreements with or, or is finalizing agreements with all the major parties. Uh, the media's got wind apparently of some of the, uh, some of the clauses and uh, we can talk about that in a little bit, but basically they have to be handed in officially uh, they're not closed yet. There are still some outstanding disagreements. They have to be handed in by Friday. Uh, on Sunday morning, there'll be a vote uh, on a new speaker of the Knesset. That's very important. Yuri Levin is going to be replaced by uh, the coalition's choice, which is Mickey Levy of Yeshatid. Then Mickey Levy will uh, take up his position as Speaker of the House, and he will then preside over what is certainly going to be uh, a very um, how do we say, a challenging few hours. There's going to be a tremendous amount of hostility from the opposition, uh, pretty much the government as it stands. The only, the only uh, party that's going to stay on from the current government is uh, Blue and White, Lik uh, Likud, and the ultra-Orthodox parties and the religious Zionist parties are going to the opposition. And uh, first of all, we'll, have, we'll hear from uh, Naftali Bennett as the incoming prime minister. He'll present the government. He'll present uh, who's going to be minister of what. He'll present uh, uh, the outlines or the guidelines of uh, this uh, coalition. And uh, he'll speak for, uh, for a certain amount of time. Then the prime minister as the leader of the largest party, Prime Minister Netanyahu, at least for the next few days, will then uh, be able to respond. And that's sure to be vociferous to say the least. And then every uh, leader of every party will uh, have the ability to speak. If the last 24 hours, 48 hours is anything to go by, uh, the attacks are going to continue to be nasty. In the last few days, Naftali Bennett has been called a suicide bomber by a member of Likud, Mai Golan. She compared uh, Naftali Bennett and Gidon Saar to suicide bombers. Um, uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties uh, called Naftali Bennett worse than reform. And in their mind, that's one of the worst curses you can call. He's not religious. He should take his kippah off. Um, uh, Dudi Am Salem of the Likud party also said, I was new, Naftali Bennett's not religious, and so now it's proven. They've come up with all sorts of conspiracies. We've heard for the probably the first time uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu and other members of this party, this concept of the deep state. I know in the US, there's uh, a lot of talk about the deep state. Well. Uh, that language has certainly uh, come across and it started to be used by uh, Netanyahu and some of his partners. The judiciary, the media is against them. They're trying to get them out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and today uh, there was a Knesset meeting uh, to try and arrange what's going to happen on Sunday. And the language that was used was, uh, has been called outrageous, uh, incitement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they still... I wouldn't say much of an opportunity. Most commentators say there's a very small likelihood that the government uh, won't be sworn in. Don't forget, as we've spoken about, it's a government of 61. So even if there's one defector, 
it could pr uh, prove problematic, or even one decides to abstain, it could still pass if there's a majority, but it would need every single one. Uh, the, the final, let's say, up until this point, outstanding uh, uh, member of Yamina who was still back and forth about what he was going to do near Obach, finally, uh, in the last couple of days, said that he will uh, vote in favor of the government. Uh, it is likely he'll be given a ministry, they say Ministry of Settlement Affairs. Um, so uh, according to uh, sources in uh, Yamina, all of their six MKs, don't forget they originally had seven, but uh, one of them decided he will not vote with the government, he'll vote against the government, so they're down to six, uh, but all six will vote for the government unless there is a major surprise. The last sort of problematic person in the coalition who seems to be making a bit of noise is Zef Elkin. Suddenly he's bringing up some demands. Now, more than likely, and this is what I'm hearing, it's just a matter of trying to get in some last minute changes, something more favorable to him and his position. Um, but he seems to be the one that uh, the eyes are on now. They could pass, I believe it was uh, today, earlier today, in their central committee, the ability of Prime Minister Netanyahu to hold three spaces open in the next uh, electoral uh, list. Uh, which was originally put there to sort of say to Naftali Bennett or Gidon Saar, if any of you come across, or even one of their members, we will then put you in a reserve spot uh, in the Likud list uh, in the next elections. And they decided to go through with that anyway, just in case, so that in that, using their language, there are any last minute defectors. But it does seem like there's very little chance, even Likud are talking that way. Um, it could also be, uh, you know, they're now using the, language, using the language that this is a done deal, and this is a government which uh, will not fall so quickly. Um, there was a, an interesting meeting today between the leaders of the ultra-Orthodox parties and the ultra-Orthodox media, and they asked for complete blackout of any uh, person in this coalition. They said, you should not interview, this is what the politicians told the media, you shouldn't interview anyone, especially not from Yamina, especially not Naftali Bennett or any of them. Uh, basically, you know, saying that uh, you should fall in line, you know, uh, with the ultra-Orthodox uh, leader, uh, political leadership. Uh, so that was certainly a, a little bit problematic. Um, and again, using some very problematic language against some of the religious members of Yumina. So it's, it's and, and another interesting element of that is they demanded of the journalists to stop saying this government won't last very long. They said they can't rally their people, their base, if they believe that this government is going to be short-lived. So it's very important, I, I believe, not just in the ultra-Orthodox media, but any of the media affiliated with any of the current government future opposition to give the impression that this will be short-lived uh, because then it's much harder to rally. There will be uh, large, large uh, gatherings and rallies over the weekend uh, outside the homes of any of the Amina or New Hope uh, members of Knesset, they believe, could still be swayed, even though it doesn't seem likely. Um, there has been, as, as I said earlier, quite a lot of incitement. Uh, they've shown on the media here uh, and around WhatsApp groups some uh, messages to some Yamina MKs, you know, calling for their death, calling for their children's to suffer. You know, there was death notices put out uh, with near Orbach's name, as if he'd already been killed. Uh, there's been all sorts of threats. Um, excommunication, terrible, terrible threats uh, to the point where I believe all but one Yamina MK now has full-time security. Uh, Naftali Bennett has got unprecedented security for, um, for a prime minister in waiting. Uh, uh, a few New Hope um, members of Knesset also receiving um, security. So, so it's very tense. My personal belief is that once the government is sworn in, um, I think the tempers will lower a little bit. I think once it's happened, you know, it, a lot of people will take a bit of a deep breath and realize, okay, now we have to take a step backwards and we, you know, the, the government will have to try and find a way to work together and the opposition will try and find a way uh, legally, constitutionally, politically to, to try and, uh, you know, bash them as much as they can. Um, there's a lot of talk about how long this government will last. Um, there are some optimistic people I, I spoke to in Yeshatir who believe that once they pass the budget, uh, because the budget is the first minefield, 
And if you don't pass a budget within six months, then the government automatically falls. But uh, a lot of the details on, on future budgets already been uh, worked out. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that um, are going to be tackled by this coalition. First of all, on religion and state, because that's a major, first of all, it should be understood that when you have a government with right wing, left wing, an Arab party, centrist, there's not gonna to be too much movement on issues where they, uh, there's a, there are diverse opinions and, and usually left and right are, are, are navigated according to your belief on the Palestinian issue and security issues. So those issues probably won't be developed uh, too much at this point because there's no way that a Naftali Bennett can agree with, uh, uh, with uh, Horowitz or Meretz or even Ram or Labour. So probably those issues are going to be put on the back burner. They understand that there are diverging uh, opinions, so that probably will be put on the back burner. But some of the issues that will be brought up, again, which can create some friction, uh, are religion and state. There's talk about, uh, for the first time, perhaps civil marriage. There's talk about um, re uh, sort of, I, and, uh, a couple of years ago, there was this, what was called the Kotel, um, uh, decision where, as, as anyone knows, who goes to the Western Wall, it's very much in the in the uh, style of an Orthodox synagogue with uh, with the divider between men and women. Um, women are not allowed to read from the Torah and, and all that sort of thing. So they created a separate uh, place. That was uh, ironically that was when Naftali Bennett, I believe, was diaspora affairs minister. Um, but that was never really uh, instituted fully, or well, that's one of the things that this government is going to do. It's going to have public transport on the Sabbath, which is something that Peter Liebman's very keen on. It's going to allow municipal rabbis to do conversion and marriage, which at the moment is centralized in the rabbinate. Um, trying to think what else. Basically, everyone, every party, as I said, has an agreement with, um, with Yashatid, but according to these guidelines, the one uh, agreement which actually stands sovereign to all other agreements is the one between Yashatid and Yamina. Whatever it says in there, if there's any contradiction in the separate uh, agreements, that's the one that counts. And Naftali Bennett certainly has a veto. In fact, both sides uh, have a veto, uh, uh, Yelapid and Naftali Bennett, on, on many of uh, these issues. Economically, there's going to be quite a lot of uh, reforms. Avito Lehman, the incoming finance minister, has pledged not to raise taxes. Um, the, he, he's pledged, uh, it came out tonight, that uh, up until now, there's, uh, there's a, a system during coronavirus where you would get paid without work, as I'm sure they had in many other countries around the world. Uh, and there's a big debate exactly when that should finish because the economy is pretty much starting to get back on its feet. But there's a lot of people who are still taking advantage of that, especially uh, amongst younger populations, whereas a lot of uh, jobs are just not being filled. There are restaurants that can't open because they can't fill their staff. So um, he's already, uh, Vitor Lehman's already been in to meet the staff in the finance ministry, and a decision has apparently been made that anyone under 45 will only have another three weeks of paid vacation, uh, and then it's back to work. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, new decisions that we've made. As I said, on some of the weightier diplomatic and security issues, those will probably take, uh, take a back seat. Um, there are still other issues that need to be worked out. We have Michele, who's going to be from the Labour Party, who's going to be transportation minister, is apparently angling for control over transportation in Judea and Samaria, something that uh, is supposed to be the... Um, uh, within the scope of the defense minister uh, ministry and certainly something that you mean a right-wing party and you hope uh, would not like to see they wouldn't like to see a left-wing uh, transportation minister uh, getting involved with these issues because obviously they have less sympathy to it so they have to still work out some of the wording there um, but it seems like uh, we have a coalition on the way and it really is just a matter of crossing the t's and dotting the i's at this point and on Friday, these coalition agreements will be handed into the Knesset. I'm sure the Likud will put out as many negative messages as possible over anything that they can get their hands on. Um, but they only have 48 hours because on Sunday, it's, it's the decision time. If the change government can bring every single member 61 votes, 
then we will have a new government and we will, for the first time in 12 years, have a new prime minister. As I said, the likelihood of that happening, I think at this point is 95%. One never knows. And as I've repeatedly said over uh, uh, many months, if not uh, longer, you never bet against VAB, but at this uh, moment in time, it doesn't seem like he had too, has too many cards left. And with that, I'm happy to open it up for any questions. All right, thank you so much. So the first question we have in is from Ken Abramowitz. Uh, do you think the Supreme Court might not allow this new government coalition to form as it violates the basic laws by allowing an Arab party to, that rejects Hatikva as the national anthem and does not accept an undivided Jerusalem? Um, well, basically, that's all worked out whether they can run. Um, all parties have to sign on to a basic declaration that they accept that Israel, uh, the nature of Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. And there are certain Arab parties who in the past have held their nose and signed on. In fact, there's probably quite a lot of language in there that even the ultra-Orthodox parties will have a problem with. But if they've been allowed to run, uh, then at this point, there's no there's no problem with them. It, that usually is worked out before the elections. Uh, and there have been some individuals who have not been able to run uh, because they did not meet the criteria. Um, in fact, I believe the only ones that have ever not been able to run is on the Jewish side, uh, on the far right Jewish side. Um, but th those are details which uh, I, I don't believe that there's anyone who's even uh, called this into question on that particular point of view. Um, it would be, you know, a lot has come out over the last few days um, about Ra, about uh, Likud's negotiations with Ram. So it's everything. Basically, the bottom line is everything that Ram will get from Bennett, according to all sources, uh, Netanyahu offered them far more. And if uh, the religious Zionist party had agreed uh, to allow uh, Netanyahu to use Ram as a as a party to support the government on the outside, that's that's the government that we would now be. Uh, witnessing. So I think that's uh, probably too late, and I haven't heard uh, that the Supreme Court is taking up this issue. Thank you. From Reuben Hawk, assuming the change government is sworn in on Sunday, what would be the considerations for enacting a law preventing an individual who is under criminal indictment from running or serving as prime minister? Um, or that, that particular law almost certainly will not be uh, put up. Yamina have said that they're not looking to pass any laws to bar any particular individual uh, from running uh, for office. What is probably going to be enacted at some point is a law that um, a prime minister can only serve two terms or eight years, whichever is longer, uh, to ensure that there isn't this uh, sort of seemingly everlasting situation. We have the same prime minister uh, for, for more than that amount of time. Uh, that would be relatively unprecedented in parliamentary democracies. Uh, but that's probably the most that uh, we'll see on that issue. I don't see it. There are many parties in that coalition who would want to pass exactly that law. Uh, but I think Yamina will veto that. They don't want to be seen. Uh, they've talked a lot about it, so one never knows. But they don't want to be seen as passing any laws which are specific to any one person, especially Netanyahu. Understood. Thank you. We have a few different phrasing of this question, but what do you think the new government will change? Do you think the new government will change things in religion? And if so, which ones? In religion or state, yes. The, that area we will see quite a, there's this thing in Israel called the status quo in religion and state, which the idea is that things uh, don't move one way or another, but that's absurd. Anyone who's seen the situation since the eighties with the advent of Shas and, and their growing power uh, that there is no status quo. It keeps on moving further and further towards the ultra-Orthodox uh, population. Uh, but any time anyone wants to move it back a little bit, even to the pre 80s uh, situation, uh, we hear these shouts of status quo, status quo. Uh, so it's, it, it's an absurd uh, uh, a statement that there is anything that looks like status quo in Israel. Uh, but it certainly is a large majority who would like to shake things up in that particular respect. We've heard a lot in, in recent weeks about that they're going to follow the line of uh, the Tsoha organization. Tsoha organization is, a, is an orthodox organization. Some may call it a liberal orthodox organization. What it wants to do is take away uh, the monopoly from the chief rabbinate or the rabbinate uh, on issues like conversion, like marriage and divorce, 
and on uh, Kashrut, on kosher at the moment, unless you have a, a certificate from the Rabinud, your restaurant will not be, cannot even use the word kosher. That's how absurd the situation is. So Tsoha has started giving certificates, but they can't use the word kosher. So they've come up with all these clever ways around it. So it's a relatively absurd situation. Uh, so there is an idea to liberalize this, to take away the monopoly of the, uh, of the uh, official rabbinate and also try and replace some of these uh, national state institutions with religious Zionists, uh, what some would call in the West, uh, modern Orthodox uh, uh, rabbis and leaders that take it away from the ultra Orthodox uh, parties and, and political control. So I think uh, we'll see quite a lot there. There is talk about things like uh, allowing, there, there was a law passed uh, over the last year, I can't remember exactly when it was, called the mini markets uh, law, which basically didn't allow mini markets to open on the Sabbath. That's something which uh, is talked about uh, to be repealed. Uh, there is talk, uh, something that Avitor Lehman would like to see and quite a few other parties is uh, public transport on the Sabbath because uh, you know, there's no rule against breaking the Sabbath in Israel, but if you don't have public transport, all you're doing is punishing people without cars, punishing the weaker elements of society. Um, so that's something that uh, we'd also like to see if it changed. But again, we'll have to see. Don't forget, Yamina still does think of itself as a religious party. Um, so it will toe the line to a certain extent. There's, that's certainly going to be a, part, uh, you know, a, a point of tension. And we'll certainly see... The ultra-Orthodox parties are certainly worried about this. They're undoubtedly there, they're extremely, extremely worried about losing their monopoly. Uh, and also maybe the stipends to their yeshiva students. Um, another thing that Avigdor Liebman and uh, Yale appeared and others are very strong on is ensuring that every school in Israel which receives some sort of government stipends has to teach basic subjects, secular subjects like English, like maths, uh, at this point in time, that is not the case, uh, but that's something that uh, coalition agreements, at least the latest version that we've seen, uh, are going to address. So um, these are some of the things which are, at least in the draft uh, coalition negotiations we've seen. Thank you. And along those lines, uh, Michael Kerbel asks, will the new government require the Haredi to serve in the IDF or some type of national service? So another thing that's come up, and don't forget, this was the thing that really started this whole cycle. If we remember back uh, after the first elections, the reason we didn't have a government is because there was no compromise uh, on this law that was written uh, by the defense ministry officials when Avito Lima was defense minister, which uh, was a really low level uh, integration for the ultra Orthodox into the army. And it was something the ultra-Orthodox would not move on. Abidur Lehman considered himself at that point compromising on compromising, compromising. And that was, remember, if we remember, that was the, the point for him. That was the red line. And he didn't enter that government. And then we went for another election, another election. And ironically, now we're back to that point. And it seems like uh, that is going to be a law. Um, it's not an overly burdensome law. As I said, it's a very low level of integration the number there's, there's a series of numbers which escalate each year but again we're talking about relatively no numbers that the ultra orthodox community almost already meets so it's more of a principle for the ultra orthodox than suddenly every ultra orthodox student is going to be pulled off into the army that's not going to happen uh, that's not on the table but the principle that there will be uh, uh, numbers that have to be met every year uh, according to this law that that's something which uh, seems like it will be certainly happening in the next government thank you from eric selkov how do you think the new government will engage with biden it's a good question uh, as i said those kind of issues um the issues of the, the palestinians and peace talks it's going to be very tricky if it comes up because, as, as we know, we have on one side uh, Gidon Sa and Naftali Bennett who are against the two-state solution. We have Abid Dordim who's certainly skeptical, uh, not necessarily against it in principle, but certainly skeptical. Uh, Gantz and Lapid in the middle, and then you have uh, uh, the Labour Party mayors on the left and Ram. So how you can try and navigate that issue with all these disparate views is going to be very, very difficult, but it depends how much room 
uh, the Biden administration, give them, it could be an opportunity for the Biden administration to try and push them uh, into it. Don't forget they, they're, they're familiar with all these figures. Benny Gantz's defense minister, he was in the US this week uh, to meet with his uh, contemporary and uh, mostly talk about the Iran deal and security issues, but still, these are not uh, new faces necessary for the American administration or many of the people in the, the relatively new American administration. Um, but as far as moving ahead on the Palestinian issue, there's been a big debate about what will be included in that coalition agreement. Because again, you have to find language which will suit everybody. Uh, and that's going to be very difficult. It'll be very interesting to see what in the end uh, comes out on Friday in this coalition agreements on that. Uh, but I think the relationship will, will be Will be good. I think uh, there's certainly a lot of mistrust between many officials in the Biden administration, which are leftovers from the Obama administration, which certainly did not have a good relationship with the Netanyahu administration. So I think there'll be a certain amount of, uh, you know, a new page uh, being drawn between the two sides. Um, and if the Biden administration still has this sort of hands-off uh, approach to the Palestinian uh, peace talks, then I don't think there'll be too many problems between them. Obviously, um, everyone, maybe except for the far left and Ram, I don't know Ram's position on this, are pretty much in line with Netanyahu and the Iran agreement, the JCPOA, at least the vast majority. So on that issue, Israel's stance will, will certainly not change vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Biden administration. Thank you for that. Uh, from Jack McKay, if Netanyahu is legally exonerated, how will that change the political dynamic? Well, legally exonerated, that probably won't be seen one way or another for a number of years. This court case is going to go on for years. Um, each case has hundreds of witnesses. Both sides have to go through the witnesses. I think we're still on the first witness weeks later of the first case, and there's still hundreds to go. So this is going to go on for years. And then we could have appeals by either side. So um, that's not going to happen for a while. That's certainly not relevant for this particular period of time. Interesting. And from Eric Selkov, uh, what will happen to Netanyahu after the new government takes over? That's, that's a good question. Uh, my feeling is, from what I'm hearing, he will stay on. Uh, he won't resign. He'll become officially leader of the opposition. Um, and my particular feeling is he'll become a very bullish opposition, really taking any opportunities to try and snipe at the government. Uh, I think he'll feel that there's an opportunity within the year to try and bring it down, or maybe it will just self-destruct itself. Um, one never knows. As I said, there are some optimists in this government who believe that it could last for over two years, especially once they get the budget out of the way. Uh, my particular feeling is I would, if I had money, I would bet on it lasting more than a year, but one never knows. Um, and Netanyahu can then present himself as an alternative when we next go to the polls. It could be that there is some movement within the Likud. We see tonight or tomorrow night, Nir Barkat is having a mega event, thousands of people spending a lot of money bringing in some top Israeli entertainers, apparently feeding the guests very, very nicely. It's a show of force. Nir Barkat is seen as the most likely um, contender to Netanyahu. He said at this point, and pretty much every uh, Likud uh, uh, you know, big week has said that uh, they're not looking to replace him at this point, but certainly there's, there's a lot of grievances within the Likud, there's, especially amongst the, uh, the more popular elements. Uh, they're not happy about the fact that they're sitting in the opposition. They feel that if Netanyahu himself would have stood aside, rather than offering everybody else and every other party, Gidon Saar and Aftali Bennett, to be first in rotation, uh, they felt that maybe he should have given that rotation to someone else in the Likud, and then they wouldn't be sitting in the opposition. There would have been no other excuse for Gidon Saar and Aftali Bennett to go with the change uh, government. So there's no love lost there, and, and they are looking for opportunities. Uh, Yuri Edelstein has been rumored to, to also be one uh, who may challenge Netanyahu. I feel that Netanyahu will probably try and shore this up uh, sooner rather than later, uh, while he's still relatively popular, because the longer he sits in the opposition, probably the, the weaker he'll look. Um, so there, are, there is some talk that he won't need, he doesn't need officially to face any leadership race until I believe 2025. Uh, I'm not 100% sure exactly how that works out. 
Um, but Netanyahu is a strategist. He knows how to stay ahead of his competitors. So don't write him off yet. And I have said to a few people this week, I would not bet against seeing uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu back in the prime minister's residence at some point in the future. Well, on that note, I guess we'll be asking people to tune in next week to see what happens. Uh, we've come to the close of our webinar and podcast. Ashley, thank you again for taking time to update us this week. And thank you all for joining us and have a great day.